Hi, I'm in the talk. I'm the founder of Charity Excellence. Uh, I've held lots of chair and chief executive roles for the last 25 years. I've been a coach and mentor, and I've taken the Charity Commission to the first tier charity tribunal on three occasions and forced them to concede on each. Some people have said that I'm really quite good at what I do. In reality, I'm actually just so old, I'm running out of mistakes to make. Not quite, but close. The purpose of this governance presentation is to make sure that you don't have to. To build beyond this, if you register and log into Charity Excellence, everything's free. Complete the governance questionnaire and it will walk you through the whole process specific to your charity. It will connect you to a whole load of support and help and resources. It gives you everything you need so you can follow on from this. So what is governance? Uh, there doesn't actually seem to be a single agreed definition. Charity Commission, Governance Code, NCBO, everybody's got their own. So what do you do with that? Uh, if they can have theirs, I can have mine. Uh, for the charity's excellent system, uh, I'm using <clears throat> a modified version of what's known as soft systems methodologies. Don't get me started on that. I will bore you to death. <clears throat> but essentially, I needed a precise definition for the modeling systems. They're about people. And this is what I distilled out of everyone else's strategic direction. You own the strategy. You may not do the spade work. You may not do all the bits and pieces. Strategy is ultimately a keyboard organization. And culture. Culture is the way we do things around here. It's unspoken. It's so much of a given that you don't need to say it. You won't read it in policies or anything like that. And when charities go wrong and turn toxic, it's that toxic culture where things like bullying, sexual harassment, or those kind of issues become ingrained. If you're on a board and your, car, your charity has a toxic culture, it's happening on your watch. So how you manage and how you were seen and how people see you is really important. Ensuring it is led and managed well. You may have a chief executive, or others or a general manager, that's fine. It may be that the, the trustees themselves are doing it, but effectively, you should be doing all the right stuff. You should be doing your budgeting. You should be complying with the law. And to achieve its charitable objectives, fundamentally, that is what charities exist to do. If the board is not focused on that, that is that that's what your charity is there for. And be careful. People's views and what they think the charity should be doing are not necessarily the charity's objects. And you mustn't operate outside your charity's objects. So if you're restricted to A, B and C, you cannot go and do D, E, F. So it's your responsibilities, strategic direction, the culture of the organisation, effective leadership and management, and delivering its charitable objectives. That, in a nutshell, is what board does. And it's about long-term, top-level stuff. You may come out of your board and, and work within the charity as a critical friend, kind of that, that's fine. But up here, the day-to-day -day running of the charity is the job of the chief executive, not you. So, managing the board. You are not responsible for doing everything, which is fortunate because you poss couldn't possibly do it. You are responsible for making sure it's done. I, I, I've heard it a lot. You know, I, I don't do accounts. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. You're collectively responsible. But you've got maybe 12 hours a year to do that. If, if you're just running on standard board things. So how do we go about that? Clear separation between operations, which is run by management, and governance, which is the role of the trustees. So when I'm a trustee, I would be working with the chair 
And effectively, you set the strategy, you agree the budget, the risk plan, and the annual plan. You must do that. That That's your authority, not mine. You hold me to account in delivering those, but you don't tell me how to do that. And then I walk into board meetings and you know, trustee will say, we want you to spend £10,000 on that. Well, if it's my budget and you've given it to me, you've signed off on it and you expect me to deliver it, you can't start spending my budget and then say it's my responsibility because it isn't. So separation. Many of us are trustees and volunteers. I have got hands-on duty in virtually every organisation I've, I've ever volunteered to be a trustee in. Um, as a volunteer, you report to management and management report to the board and you hold management to account but don't tell them how to do a job you gave them to do I mean, what does that look like uh, i was one of the founding directors of the national skills academy i went in on a very regular basis i would work hands-on directly with people in areas like business development and membership and stuff like that. And I would work with them and I'd, you know, I've done this and there's that and possibly that. And they turn around to me and say, what do you want me to do? And the answer is, that's not me. I'm a critical friend, but the Skills Academy is run by the chief executive and the resource director underneath her. They make those decisions. And they say, but yeah, but you chaired the finance and executive committee Ultimately, if we're going to do it, it's going to land on your desk. I said, what I will tell you is what I would want to see when it arrived at that committee. This is what I would be expecting. And at that point, it is my business because I'm chairing the committee. But up to that point, that's that's for you to do. So that's how you do it. Um, and it, it's more a mentality. And boards act collectively. You're all responsible. You don't even have to be at the meeting where the decision was made. You're still responsible. And individual trustees cannot go about telling the chief executive what to do. In my first chief exec role, I had bucket loads of that. I had to go to the chair and say, look, I've got 10 trustees. I've got 10 different people telling me how to do my job. Which one am I supposed to listen to? So board directions acting collectively and I don't do accounts everybody does accounts and the only way that an individual trustee can specifically operate like that is for example in the skills academy the board said to me we need this done Ian you're getting fingered for this one um, we need you to go in and work with the chief executive. And specifically, we need A, B, C, D. We need it delivered. We've heard what you've said about the analysis. That's fine by us. We just need it done. You go make it happen. And I would walk in and go, right, this is how we're going to do it. The board has given me specific authority to do this, and I will go and do it. I can act on their behalf. I'm not acting on my own. And board composition. To be effective, Boards need to have the skills and experience and they need to be diverse. And you've got a problem because if you look at all the skills and experience you'd need to have got a big long list. If you look at how you're going to be really fully diverse, funnily enough, you've got a whole bunch of different people. How are you going to get all of them on the board? Well, the board would end up about 20 or 30 strong and it's not going to work. So you're never going to... I won't say never, but it's very unlikely that you will ever have that perfect board that's there and representative of everyone. Some boards get slewed towards the kind of professional end of things. Diversity is about equality. It's about rights and justice. You should do that. But it's about more than that. Diverse boards perform better. And there's no argument about that. McKinsey in the US, they did this analysis with uh, commercial companies and diverse commercial companies make more profit. The boards just work better. They're much more risk aware. They're much closer to their customers and they're much more likely to spot innovation 
and ideas like that. They work better. But you can't have perfect both. One that we often see, lived experience, many people, many boards don't have that. They don't have the professional skills. They're not as articulate, probably, but their contribution is different. It is not less than anyone else's. And, and I've seen that. I was on the board of an FE college back in the 90s. Uh, we wanted to deal with racism. We were all children of the 70s. Racism for us was black people and, and, and Asian. That's, that's our experience. Uh, and we had a young woman of Asian heritage and we had a young disabled man, both students. And the board, before the conversation started, turned around to her and said, hey, does this work for you? And she went, no. And she went, the people being beaten up outside the nightclubs are gypsies and Muslims and Albanians. Uh, and I may have a bit of a darker suntan than everyone else. I'm just a local girl, as far as anyone's concerned. I'm not really seen like that. The racism's elsewhere. And so what we did is we went back and we said, can you find out how many nationalities in the college? 30 different nationalities. I mean, it's the Cotswolds. We had no idea. We were locked within the, lock, the framework of our experience and someone with the lived experience of what it's like today fundamentally changed the direction of the board. Do not push away people with lived experience, but you need enough members to carry out your role. Generally, the minimum to coordinate, that is enough people at the table to be allowed to make decisions in the Charity Commission standard is two. So if you've got two people around the table, and that's what it says in your governing document, you can make decisions. Three is pretty good. Charities will often have four, five, or six. That's fine. You know, it, 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 it spreads the workload. You get a better mix of skills. So the more around the table, the more capacity you have. The recommended maximum is 12. Uh, I entirely agree with that. Once you go beyond 12, um, you don't really get the decision making. It, it, it becomes much more difficult to manage and run the board. So if it's a two hour meeting and you've got 12 people, divide that by 12 and you suddenly find that nobody's doing terribly much talking each sort of things over shoot. And having a regular turnover of members helps to bring you in, in new ideas and skills. Um, the recommendation is no more than nine years. You get the person, uh, if you want, a job done properly, give it to a busy person. Every charity's got one. They're the hero that carries everything on their shoulders. They've probably been there for years. If you kick them out because they've been there more than nine years, that's probably not a smart move. Uh, however, boards who are just full of people who've been there for years and years and years and years, you haven't got the ideas. You, you, you need to bring in fresh blood. That, that does make a difference in board performance. Board behaviours. Um, you will find downloadable resources within Charity Access for all of this stuff. It is good to agree behaviours. I find that where boards tend to go wrong, it's not about what they're doing, it's the way they behave. It's expectations of each other. If everyone's clear about what those expectations are, and we all agree that we're going to hold each other positively to account to meet those expectations, it works really well. Um, it's, it's great. So what would we expect from each other? Be prepared for meetings. Read the papers. Now, the papers have to go out of time. They are not 30 pages long. Or if it's a long paper, it's got a summary at the top, etc. You know, you need to make this work. But if you come into that board meeting, take the papers as read. And I've walked into board meetings as the chief exec, and they've said, oh, would you like to read through your paper, Ian? And I go, why would I do that? I mean, if you've only got a two-hour meeting, why the hell would I read the bloody paper that you've had for the last week? Please. So I expect people to come having read papers. It makes things work quicker and easier. Think strategically. You are the top-level thinkers. If you are not thinking strategically, who is? Now, everybody likes the hands-on, nitty-gritty about the event that happened, or we had this great thing with the pussy cats and all that kind of all that stuff's really interesting, really nice. I mean, we all love it. I love it. I mean, for God's sake, contracts are boring. But you're there to do the important stuff. You have a job to do. It should be fun, but it's not a game. 
So think strategically, think longer term, be action focused. Often what will happen is things get stuck in a loop and they just go round and everybody loves talking about it and nobody will make a decision. Uh, in my last role, I had that and it went round and round. It had been going on for two years. And I said to a certain member of the board, I have to be honest, I think you should just JFDI it. And before the board, the chair could intervene, she said, what does that mean? And the answer is just effing do it. Um, and he said afterwards, I'm on the autism spectrum. I make rooms go quiet. Um, he said afterwards, you know, it's not really, maybe not. I said, you spent two years talking about it and I fixed it in one sentence. And he went, well, yes. So action focused, it's about doing stuff. Talking is very important. Bringing people in is very important. But if you're just talking, you're not achieving anything. Ask the questions that need to be asked. I mean, I've had it from members of staff when I've spoken to them and they say, can't they see it? Don't they know what's wrong? And I answer, they do. They're all working really, really, really hard to ignore it. And when I say, what's the big grey flappy thing with a long nose in the corner, and people get stressed about that. It's difficult sometimes to ask the question they ask. Ask them constructively in a positive manner. Don't say GFDI. Um, we've been talking about this for two years. What's preventing us from arriving at an implementing decision? That kind of thing. Be constructive, be future focused. It is likely there are other people in the room want to ask the question as well. There are no stupid questions. Somebody needs to ask, is that risk too big? Are we actually going to be able to bring money in to be able to do that? Ask those questions. So hold people to account, but do not have a blame culture. What does that mean? Right. If you give me responsibility to deliver the budget, you hold me to account to do that. Ian, forecast is off track. Can you tell us what action you're taking to bring it back on where it needs to be? That's accountability. COVID has just shut the entire organisation. Everything's been completely blown out of water. Ian, the budget is overspent. That's your fault. That's blame. COVID's not within my control. So that's the difference between the two. And support and positively challenge the staff team. If I say to you that's wrong, or that won't work, I'm effectively poking you in the chest. If I poke you in the chest, like is not, you're going to poke me in the chest back. We're human. So what we need to do is we need to think about how we ask those questions. And so what I say is I can't change what last week happened last week. I really bother about whose fault it is or whose fault we think it is. What we can change is what's going to happen next week. And that's about, instead of poking them in the chest, it's about looking forward. Focus on the problem, not the person. So you've brought this proposal here. That looks really high risk. How can we be confident that that risk will be managed? How can we be reasonably sure <clears throat> that the income for your project will arrive. Okay, you say you've got it in hand. Thank you for that. Could you tell us what you're going to do, who'll do it and when it will be done by? Then you record that in the minutes. It's about being focused, action focused. Not poking in the chest, but just saying, how are you going to do it? Who's going to do it? When's it going to be done by? And value each other and say thank you. We don't say thank you nearly often enough. Everybody complains. I'm Scottish. I complain all the time. Um, I actually promised myself the day that I became perfect, I was just going to whine and be miserable forever. Uh, and in 63 years, I've never actually managed it. I'm gutted personally, but it means that I don't whine too much. Saying thank you is great. And board meetings are a fabulous place to do that. When I was chief executive of care group, I'm sure that all the managers knew that if anyone on the staff or volunteer team 
did something that was above and beyond, that was different, didn't have to be a big thing. Um, cleaner that cleaned the toilets on a Saturday when there was a big accident and it was really fun. It's the person that went and got the shopping and got special Easter egg for the nephew of, 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 of them. But something like that, they would drop me an email and I would handwrite a letter to that individual and when I went into the board meeting, I would say, you want to know <clears throat> uh, that Susie, who is the Polish cleaner, works at the weekends, uh, this incident happened and she came in and she fixed all that and she worked really, really hard and nobody had any right to expect her to do that. And, and the residents were really, really taken with that and they were really pleased. And I, I just think I'd like to invite the board to say thank you. So the board said, I can go in minutes, phone up the manager and say, <clears throat> the board have told me that they want me to pass their personal thanks on to Susie for what she did. And that was really fabulous. And you're modeling what good behavior and good things looks like. And thank yous like that, Christmas cards, anything like it is not difficult. So, and ultimately be slow to take offense, quick to apologize. That defuses so much. I'm sorry if what I said upset you, but I didn't want to upset you. I'm not actually saying I'm wrong, but I didn't want to upset you. Those are the kind of behaviours that, that help to make the meeting work well. Being forgiving of each other, being valuing each other, constructive, positive challenge, looking forward, being decision focused, thinking strategically. So the Charity Governance Code is not the law and it's not from the Charity Commission. It's the principles and recommended practice is very similar to all of them. And there are other charity related ones. So there is a sports governance code. There is a Scottish governance code. So be aware, this is not the only one. Public sector's got no own principles. It's applicable to everyone, but it's aspirational. You don't have to do it, basically. It's not a legal or regulatory obligation. And applying it, you use what's called apply or explain. So either the code says X and we do it, or it says X and we do this instead, or it says X and that doesn't apply to us. And that's how you should approach using the code. I think it's a bit motherhood and apple pie. Uh, in the Charity Excellence System, it uses the various seven various sections of the Charity Governance Code in the reporting. So once you've done the governance assessment, you can literally do your dashboard and it'll tell you where you're doing in every aspect in your compliance with the code. Uh, trustees' main responsibilities. Uh, all trustees should be aware of what is known as CC3A, if you're in England and Wales at least. Um, and that is the Charity Commission's essential trustee. Um, I often think the Commission isn't all that brilliant. The CC3 actually, it's a decent piece of kit. You should be giving this to every single trustee on induction and all of your trustees around the table. They should know this. And if they haven't seen it, give it to them. It is really quite well. So you must ensure your charity is carrying out its purposes for the public benefit. What's the public benefit? It's the Charities Act. So the public benefit has a number of dimensions. It's an exclusively charitable purpose as per your objects, education, poverty, animal welfare. So you're doing that. You are not going outside your objects. You're staying within your objects. It is available to a reasonable portion of the public. You can restrict it. So if you're a disability charity and it's only available to disabled people, that's fine. But you can unreasonably restrict access. It is beneficial. It is clear it's within exclusively charitable purpose. It does good. And any harm is way below the beneficial. And private benefit is incidental, i.e., the way in which anyone benefits from this is trivial. It's irrelevant. So um, you pay expenses to trustees. There isn't a problem with the beneficiary in receipt of the charity's work being on the board. Don't know that. That's not a problem. But generally, charities will not be picked. They may be if it's in your governing document and there are bits and pieces you can do. But generally, they're not picked. 
You must comply with your governing document and the law. Now, your governing document is key. There are standard ones created by the Commission, so I can say to you in the CIO constitution, 48 is two trustees. That is, you need a minimum of two trustees present to make valid decisions. Other governing documents, particularly really old ones, may in actual fact say something different. If what's in your governing document is different to the Charity Commission guidance, you have to follow your governing document. So the Companies Act no longer requires you have to have an AGM. If your governing document says you have to have an AGM, you have to have an AGM. So it is the key document. Um, and it's one that you must be aware of. It will include things like powers, the ability to borrow money, to, to, to take out loans, how you appoint people, how you remove them, how long they serve for. All of that must be uh, complied with. Generally, in complete legal gobbledygook, a, a really dull, boring document. Very few people read it, but sit down, read it, make sure you get what it says. And the law. This is hard work because you're subject to all the laws that everybody else is subject to health and safety and everything like that. There's no get out on that stuff. And you're subject to the Charities Act. So you get that as a little extra to go with it. Um, you must act in your charity's best interest. This is the same as responsibility for directors. So Mr. Smith may sit on the board and may be absolutely passionate about this. And this is absolutely important. If it isn't what the charity needs, Mr. Smith, when's your neck in? The charity isn't run for you. It's running its objects. So always, 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 how do we demonstrate that this is in the best interest of the charity? So if a trustee is conflicted, so for example, um, if you are belong to a company that sells services to the charity, if you are paid for services to the charity, um, if the person that, that, that that's involved, you're looking at the chief executive's pay or appraisal or something like that, and you're married to the chief executive, or you have a close relationship with the chief executive, then you're conflicted and you're ex basically excluded from those decisions because you can't act in your personal best interest and act in the charity's best interest at the same time. It's not possible. So you're taken out of the loop and the remaining trustees would make those decisions and that should be recorded in the minutes. You must manage your charity's resp resources responsibly. Um, so I don't do accounts. We all do accounts. Everybody does accounts. You have no choice. And you don't need to know about all the accounts. If you do not understand the finance report, say, I don't understand this. Please, could you explain it to me? And I've sat there in board meetings and I've said it maybe four or five or six times to a member of the executive. We don't understand what you've written. Could you please explain that in language that we understand? And eventually they get the message and everyone can ask questions. So what you're saying to me is the budget's on target and you're absolutely confident that we'll come in on target at the end of the year. Yes or no? What are the key areas of risk? Are we confident that, that, that we've, we've got those covered and it's actually, it's okay? So you said that you're going to do this and then how sure are you that that will address the issue and how will we know when that issue has been addressed? Anyone can ask these questions. You don't need to read the accounts. You just need to ask the questions. So it's not as difficult as it looks. Um, you need to hear, are you happy that you've got all the answers you want? And if you are, that's fine. Okay. You need to act with reasonable care and skill. Now, the courts know that trustees are volunteers. So... If I'm a finance director on quarter of a million a year, fat chance, um, and I screw the company accounts up, I go to court, the court will hold me over the calls absolutely correctly. If you're a volunteer and you're not an accountant, and you've done your best, by and large, the courts will, will, will go with that. I mean, kids' company, some of the stuff that was going on in kids' company was awful. They got away with it because the volunteers are doing their best. But if you're an accountant, the courts will expect 
a higher standard from you. And everyone should have reasonable care and skill. So if someone said, we have got a serious issue, we've got sexual harassment or abuse, the board knows about it and hasn't done anything about it, well, that's not reasonable care and skill. And if you're not sure what to do, you should seek professional advice, either from a lawyer, from an accountant, or some other advisor like that, or go to the ICO for data prints, or go and seek the charity commission. If you need advice, go and get it. And you should ensure your charity is accountable. Um, to be honest, I don't think that really happens. Uh, I personally know about some truly dreadful things. Um, you should be accountable to your beneficiaries. The problem is they can make you and the Charity Commission won't. So you have to make yourself. It's actually quite hard. So I was in, in, in a charity and I said to the chair, um, what have the beneficiary said or done that has influenced or changed a trustee decision? And he couldn't name anything. So we sent him all the information to what? How do you know that you're delivering what your beneficiaries want and that you are accountable to your beneficiaries and having lived experience on the board is a good way to go down that road. So liabilities. As long as you're incorporated, you've limited liability protection. So if you're a charitable company or a CIO, you're incorporated. Ditto for CICs, or they're not charities. If you're an unincorporated association, an unregistered charity, or if you're a charitable trust, you are not incorporated. You do not have limited liability protection. And why that matters is, incorporation is basically a body. I'm so old, I did Latin, I got my name. And it's a body. In law, only a person can enter into contracts and be sued and sue. So an incorporated charity can sign a contract and you can sue the charity. And you have limited liability and protection because the veil of incorporation protects the directors. If the charity is not incorporated, in law it doesn't exist. So the only people who can enter into the contracts are the people running it. And if you get sued, it's you personally that's being sued not the charity, because it doesn't exist. So if you're unincorporated or you're a trust, things like employing staff, signing leases, that cracking idea to do the bungee fundraising exercise, maybe not. I personally wouldn't. And make sure that you've got insurance. However, if you do have incorporation, you have that limited protection. But you must and act in the best interest, you must manage your conflict of interest, and you must exercise due diligence care in doing so. You should make that you are sufficiently informed taking any advice you need. We have got an allegation of serious abuse. Are you taking the relevant guidance and are you following it? Are you taking account of all relevant factors you're aware of? Well, the chief is ex telling me it's not that serious a case. Yeah, but that's the third time this year. There's something around here is not right. And you can see what charities didn't do that. So at Oxfam, the top team knew that women in high tea were being sexually abused. And I can probably run off, off the top of my head, about a dozen charities big, big charities where we're talking sexual harassment, bullying, abuse. And the boards knew. If you know, you're responsible. So, and you must also make reasonable decisions. Now, the charity regulator in the courts can tell you to run your charity properly. That's their job. They are not entitled to tell you how to run your charity. So if you go outside, this is what you're going to do, you're entitled to do that. But you must make a reasonable decision. So they're entitled to look at you and say, 
did you look at this? Did you consider all the things? And given everything that you knew and you had taken those factors and you had taken legal advice, you decided to do X. Was that a reasonable thing to do? It might have been right. It might have been wrong. But was it a reasonable decision to make? And if it is, that's fine. You're covered. By and large, you're OK. There are some exceptions. Corporate manslaughter, things like um, bribery act, uh, you don't get out. But by and large, it would be very, very rare for a charity trustee to be disqualified or taken to court. You would really need to kick the backside out of it. And policies. Right, memorandum and articles of association are for a charitable company. For a CIO, it's probably called the constitution. It may be called your club rules, if you're a little football club or something like that. But basically, it's the rules for running your organisation. Now, the Charity Commission has standard ones that you must use. And they're, yeah, fine. Legal gobbledygook, but they're all pretty fine. Um, if you've got really old ones, they may have things in there that really don't look like what you get nowadays. So people will phone me up and say, I know, and I want to do this. And the response always is, what is in your governing document? Because what your governing document says X, then X is the answer. So it is actually really important. So objects, your objects are what you do. What the board chooses to do within its objects is a matter for the board entirely. You may not do things outside of your objects, ultra varies. So someone phoned me up and he said, I, I want to do footy for young black guys in London. And I went, just don't. Because if you do, and that's your object, you can only do football. You can only do it for young people. You can only do it for men. You can only do it for black people. You can only do it in London. Everything else is ultra varies. So if you make it advancing sport, for the Bain community in South East England, if you get the ladies hijab cricket team in Ken, you quit it. That's fine. So be aware, not outside it. Powers, they limit what you can do. Can we take out loans? Can we buy property? Can we invest? All of those powers are in there. If you've got the powers, you can use them. If you don't have the powers, you can't. And all the meetings and resolutions and voting and members and trustees and winding up, it's all in there. Do you need an AGM? How many trustees can you have? What is the maximum? What's the minimum? How long do they serve for? All of that kind of stuff. How do you vote at meetings? Can you have postal meetings? Are you allowed to use electronic communication? Blah, 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 blah. It's all in there. That's the core document. If you have any questions about running those kind of meetings and how those decisions are made, you must go to your governing document because it overrules everything except the law of the land. Board policies. I don't think you need a, a huge number. You can have a conflict of interest policy. And to be honest, the modern uh, constitutions have got pretty much everything in there. I do think the code of conduct is good. It's about behaviours that have worked together, how we treat each other. I, I find... If, if we all know how we're going to work, problems are less likely to happen. Where I find that I get problems on board is if I'm sitting there thinking we're here to do X and someone else is sitting over there and they're thinking we're going to do it Y, then they and I are not in the same place. And, and that, that that's when things go wrong. And a, a code of conduct is a good way of helping everyone to stand in the same place and have a conversation about how you want to work. There, there are no legal rules to it. Uh, and there are no rights and wrongs. You know, it, it's what you agree with yourselves. Anything you want in terms of board policies or related policies of any kind whatsoever, log into Charity Excellence, speak to the in-system bunny, the one with the sunglasses, click his policy button, tell him what policy you want, he'll hop off, he'll bring it back, he'll download it on your screen for you, and you can just adjust it and use it. What other policies do you need? The rules... Uh, yeah, it's really difficult. It depends entirely what you're doing. Um, but the board should at least scrutinise and approve those policies it considers to be essential. What does that look like? Generally, it would be about reserves, how much money you keep spare for the rainy day. 
if you have a health and safety at work policy, I would certainly expect the board to approve that. If you're working with children or vulnerable adults, definitely safeguarding, probably data protection. Other policies you may need to have, a privacy statement for your website, um, that kind of thing. But some people look at it and say, charities were tiny, they had 40 policies, they were huge. And what I said to the board is, nobody's going to read this stuff, mate. It's just not. It isn't going to happen. And by the way, you've made a huge rod for your own back because you've now got an entire administrative process to keep all these things up to date. And all the board ever does is review policies. Where's the value in that? So I tend to look at policies, keep them short and keep them sweet. But I make sure they're approved. I make sure they're compliant. I make sure that everybody's read them. And I make sure they're being done. Those are the key issues. Is this stuff being done? Writing out in a piece of paper doesn't change anything. And having lots of pieces of paper doesn't make any difference at all. So think about what is it we need? How much do we need? Go into charity actions. There are over 40 to choose from. Don't get carried away. Just take the stuff you need and then make sure it's being done. And that's it. Say thank you very much. Um, that is a really quick gallop through it. Uh, I hope I haven't frightened you because being a trustee is a fabulous role. I've been really proud to, to belong to many organisations and often it's been the really junior and small staff who've been really inspirational. You can't help everyone, but I watch charities every day fundamentally changing people's lives. So it's a job as a trustee. You must take it seriously. You must do your best, but you should have fun and it should be a very satisfying. And the number of trustees who are disqualified or end up in court are very, very few. So it's not something I would worry about but it is important that we do it well because there are people who are relying on us. Thank you if you're a trustee. Thank you if you're volunteering to be a trustee. You make a big difference to the lives of people in this country. I and so many others are grateful to you.